If there's any of you that want to go with Children's Church and you'd rather do that, go right ahead. I won't be offended. I'm also un- wondering what the lighter is for up here. Am I, am I supposed to light a fire under each of you? I... <coughs> As I was introduced, I'm, I'm Brad Johnson, and I have ret- retired as the lead pastor at Faith Evangelical Free Church in Acton, about a half an hour from here, and uh, I've been retired about a year and a half now. Um, I'm also doing a part-time ministry with the New England District of the Evangelical Free Church, where I just go and sit and talk and get paid for it. Um, actually, I'm supposed to do some listening, too, as I meet with pastors and as my wife joins me with pastors and their wives. Um, so that's what I do part-time, um, and I also fill in for pulpits, uh, especially one where the people are so welp- welcoming to us. I mentioned to my wife when uh, Pastor Emmanuel asked if I would fill in for him. Um, I said, we were welcomed so much by your people, we would love to come back. Um, and so uh, we're here because you loved us. How's that? Scripture today is found in James chapter 1. And I've been told that, you've start, that Pastor Emmanuel has started a series in the book of James and that you've already had several sermons in the book of James. And so I just suggested to him, hey, just let me know what passages you would want and I'll, I'll just continue with your series. So we're going to look at verses 16, 17, and 18, just three of them this morning. And it looks like they're being projected. Super. You could just leave that up during the sermon. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, and then next week we'll look at beginning with verse 19 to the end of the chapter. Starting with verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought forth, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's pause and ask the Lord's blessing upon his word. My my Father, our Father, I ask that you would speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your precious word and for these words that we've just read. We believe that they come forth from you, that they're God-breathed words. So therefore, they're important. They're important for us to pay attention to and to learn from. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not be deceived. Pause. Too many times when we're reading through Scripture, we just sort of read, and we keep right on reading, and, and sometimes we just think, uh, well, I've got, I've got this, you know, some people will say a chapter a day will keep the devil away. No, we just got to keep reading. And I like to just pause when there's a phrase. So, do not be deceived. What is deception? How easily can we be deceived? I'll tell you, with, with social media today, the world is filled with deception. Can we trust hardly anything that we read? My wife came to me yesterday and showed me a text. Some place was asking for our address, you know, as if they needed it for something. No, it was just a scam. I know she and I got caught in a scam uh, getting some plane tickets one time. Couldn't trust the, the website that we went to wasn't the real one. We were deceived. Uh, my father-in-law was an IBMer. He knew computers. He knows what to do with computers. He got caught a little while ago. It's so easy to be deceived. There's scammers everywhere. However, it's not just since social media has been around. It's not just the last 20 years, 25 years. Deception goes way back. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve being talked to by the serpent representing Satan. Oh, you can go ahead and eat that. God knows it'll give you knowledge. 
she was deceived. Ever since then, there's been deception. Ever since then. My wife did a project in the book of Genesis for a class she was taking. Do you realize deception is throughout all 50 chapters of Genesis? Constantly, there's people deceiving others as it represents, really, sin, which is at the root of deception. For us here in James, the idea of deception is really the idea of God tempting anyone. See, back in verses that you've already looked at, back in James 13, 1, 13, and 14, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot te be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. See, we're deceived if we believe that God is tempting us. That's what the passage is. That's the context. Who does this luring and enticing that's talked about in verse 14? Satan is the one who tempts. Now, I'm somewhat known for what I call rabbit trails. Rabbit trail is usually a thought that I've had or a thought that I think somebody sitting in the congregation might have that isn't directly tied to what it is I'd like to say. But if I don't say it, then your mind might wander, and I certainly don't want that. And I certainly don't want my mind to wander. So I've got a little rabbit trail here. So we're going to just talk about a little something that's not directly tied, but I think was important because I began to think about it as I was preparing this message. Since the beginning, deception has been part of the enemy's plan. But I think it helps us to understand how we get tempted and deceived. What areas, what ways. Let me read for you a verse. It's found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. Now, there's three things listed there. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride in possession. Do you realize that that's a pattern that Satan uses? If you look at the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, Eve saw it was good for food. Physical, but with her eyes. And it says it was a delight to her eyes. And it was desired to make one wise. Guess what? Those are the same three things of desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and pride in possessing things. Well, it's not just there. Have you thought about David's temptation with Bathsheba? The sin that he ended up having? He saw that she was beautiful. He desired to have her. And he said, aren't I king? I can have anything I want. Same three. What about Jesus in the desert being tempted by Satan? He was told to turn stones to food, the physical needs. He was, Satan showed him all the kingdoms, desire the eyes. He told him to throw himself off the temple and the angels would take care of him. Satan uses the same three kinds of temptations. No, he doesn't use them all together all the time. But I think that's good for us to be thinking and to, to realize if I'm being tempted with something physical, if I'm being tempted by looking at something, if I'm being tempted by my pride, those are all ways that Satan deceives. And he seems to be kind of in a rut with using the same thing. Satan's not creative like God is. That's the end of the rabbit trail, right? Now we're back on James. 
and we're talking about do not be deceived. Who shouldn't be deceived? Well, verse 16 says, my beloved brothers. He's talking to believers. James is talking to those who are in the body of Christ. That's who he's writing to. In uh, verse 1, he's talking to those in the dispersion. Those are the ones that were in Jerusalem and because of persecution, they escaped and they were dispersed all over that region of the world. And that's who James is writing to. The Christians who had left Jerusalem, the dispersion. And it says right there in verse 2, he's writing to help my brothers. He's talking to them about the trials that they face. Trials that are testing of our faith in verse 3. And certainly our faith is put to the test in this present culture. And in verse 12 it says we are to remain steadfast under trials. We must stay faithful like Jesus did. But he says, as we've read, when tempted, it's not God. And verse 16, which is one of our verses for today, in essence is saying, don't be deceived into thinking that God is the author of temptation. Now, you might right away just say, I don't, I don't think God does that. There's a lot of ways that we act and live as believers that really show that we're succumbing to deception. We're succumbing to the temptations. And we think that God has done it. When's the last time you said, well, why did that happen? That's actually a questioning of God. That's actually allowing yourself to be deceived into thinking, oh, well, God did that terrible thing. Sometimes we think we're beyond being tempted. We're beyond being deceived. Well, the problem is the construction of this verse, if you look in the original language, it actually has the idea of stop being deceived. Like they were being deceived. And James is writing to them and saying, listen, you're being deceived. Stop. See, so believers could be deceived. They were already being deceived. Sometimes we see areas of temptation, but sometimes we think more highly of ourselves and we think, well, I'm a pretty good Christian. God's kind of lucky to have me. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So we're to be trusting God and to not think more highly of ourselves. I'll tell you, I may be a pastor, but I'm just as deceived as other people in some areas. And I'm just, I'm a sinner saved by grace through Jesus Christ, just like any one of you. And yeah, you ought to have a certain respect for your pastor, but just realize he's a sinner just like you are. So he's going to say some things wrong or do some things wrong. If Jesus could be tempted, certainly we can. And we need to be aware of how and what ways that we can be tempted and deceived as Christians. Now, here are some general areas. If the Bible says one thing and the culture says another, what do you believe? Well, most of us say, oh, I would believe the Bible. But in our culture, I keep meeting all kinds of Christians who take the cultural view of sexuality and all that that includes as opposed to what the Bible teaches, that God established male and female and how that relates to what is marriage to God. Or are we being deceived into thinking, oh, well, 
that's just the old way of thinking. And the Bible really was written for that era, and we should change it and believe what the culture is saying. That's deception. I think the same thing about creation and evolution. I think we're deceived into saying, oh, the world must be billions of years old. Well, those are people saying that who've already made the assumption there is no God. So if there's no God, then they have to come up with a theory of evolution. And I hope you realize it is a theory. And oh, the, the newest one is the Big Bang Theory. Well, where did all the stuff come from that supposedly was in the Big Bang? See, now you still got to answer this question of where did everything come from? Are you deceived about creation and evolution? Are you deceived about the truth of Christianity? I know a pastor of a church who says Jesus is only one of the many ways you can get to heaven. And he actually says it's like having a stained glass window and the light of the sun coming through the many different glasses and each of those different ways are ways that you could go to get to God. I asked him one time, so what does that make God the Father? God the Father sent his son to be sacrificed. If there's another way to get to heaven, why in the world would God the Father sacrifice His Son? So are we deceived? Are there different ways that we can be saved? As believers, don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. We can also learn from these verses that we can be deceived by our possessions. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The idea here is that God is the giver of good. It rules out that he could tempt anybody. How many gifts does he say here are given from God? Every good gift. Every gift perfect gift. Nothing but good comes from God. God's gifts are kindness and helpfulness. Does anyone else give good? Well, if I think of growing up, my parents gave me lots of good presents. I remember one time I was very disappointed. I asked for a particular thing and they sort of misunderstood and they gave me this tiny little radio that I could plug something into and it was not what I had thought about at all and I was so disappointed. But certainly, I've received many good gifts. Matthew 7, verses 9 to 11 says, Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now here's my question. At the root of all things, where does everything come from? What do you have that you deserve and is that a deception? You know, the advertisements today are filled with, you deserve this. You know, uh, go to this bank, you, you deserve a loan. You deserve this special car. You deserve good health. Uh, they use this word with deserve with all of these things that ultimately are want. Not even need, but want. But they throw that deserve word in there, and then you think, oh, maybe, maybe I should get that. We're deceived. Who gives happiness? I remember with our kids, we always used to say, that's not fair. Yeah, you're right, life isn't fair. See, we're deceived into thinking we are owed all of these things. 
What do we have that isn't from God? See, even when I say that my parents gave me some good gifts, how did they give me good gifts? Well, they taught them how to, you know, to work and they earned money and all the things that were supplied to them ultimately came from God because apart from God, there is nothing. Oh, yeah, we need to work hard, but even a work ethic, where does that come from? Is that just because that's what I learned? Or is that what God has been teaching me? See, ultimately, we could follow everything back to that God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. It's from above. There's nothing that we have that God hasn't given us. The very breath that we're breathing this morning is part of His creation. And it has to be just the right mixture of all of the different elements that are in the air around us. What about the food that we have? It's all grown and part of His amazing system. Light and darkness, heat and coolness. I hope you recognize that uh, we orbit around the sun, and if we were much closer, this earth would burn up. And if we were much further away, it would all be an ice cube. All that God has given Listen to Psalm 8. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's only nine verses. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. See, everything He has placed under our dominion because He's in charge of it. He's made it. It all goes back to Him. But what are we that He should even think about us? See, our picture of God is often way too small. And our picture of ourselves way too big. We enter this world with nothing and we leave it with nothing. This is true of every person who's ever lived. And every possession that we have is a gift from above. It's only the grace and love of God that that He even has thoughts about us. Don't be deceived into thinking you deserve anything. Finally, we can learn from these verses that we can be deceived by a false understanding of God. So we can be deceived in thinking that as Christians we won't be deceived. We can be deceived by the things and the possessions that we think we deserve. And we can perhaps be the greatest deception is not understanding who God is. Let me read verses 17 and 18 again. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of creation. So who does God say that he is here? Well, there's four different descriptions of him that I see here. First, he's the father of lights. It's probably talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars. He's the creator of light. Every gift, everything we have, comes from the one who created the lights. Powerful enough to create the sun, which they tell us is a very small star. 
In fact, in Genesis, if you read the creation story, after each day he said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And after he created Adam and Eve, it was very good. So everything that he's made is good. Who is God? He's the Father of lights. The Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now here the writer of James is taking that idea of the Father of lights. And he's taking that, those lights and he's saying, I'm going to give you an illustration to show you that God doesn't change. All the lights change, don't they? We just did it a couple days ago had the longest day of the year, and it's already getting shorter. Maybe we haven't noticed it yet, but certainly by December when we get the shortest day of the year, we don't give very much light. They say January and February are the biggest months of depression because we have so little light. You can go up north. We've, we spent some time in Alaska, and we were there uh, during the summer, and the sun never sets. You can see it on the edge of the horizon at one or two in the morning. See, so light varies. And in fact, at noontime, when the sun is directly over you, you don't have much of a shadow, do you? But at the end of the day, your shadow can be 20, 25 feet, 30 feet long, depending on how low the sun is. So the lights are constantly changing. During the day, it's bright. During the night, the sun is reflecting on the moon. We have the stars. Light is changing. But with God, there's no variation or shadow due to change. Because God doesn't change. God is without shadows. God is without variation. We change. You like somebody. They're a good friend. Then they do something that you think, how could they do that to me? Now you don't like them as much. We change, don't we? Do you realize God never changes in His attitude towards you? His love is constant. He doesn't like it when we sin. He wants to offer us forgiveness. In your service this morning, you had a time of confession. Do you realize all of you became totally cleansed at that moment? That's because of what Jesus did for us. That's where forgiveness comes from. But God doesn't change in His attitude towards us. He's constantly loving us, giving us good things. There's no variation. There's no change. Of His own will, He brought us forth. Beginning of verse 18. It was His desire to create this world. Now, if you've ever created something, if you've ever built something with your hands, if you've ever made something, if you've ever uh, put something together that you've made, you've probably made it for your own purpose, your own satisfaction. Oh, maybe you were making it for someone else as a gift, but still there's that satisfaction of what you've made. We were made purely by the will of God. Of His own will, He brought us forth. Is this an area of deception? We think, I can do anything I want. I'd, I'd suggest, though, that none of us had much to do with our birth. We, um, we don't have much to do with when we die. Did you ever thought, well, I think, why do you eat? Well, some of us eat because we enjoy it. That's my problem. Some of us eat because we need to to keep alive. Is that a choice? I suppose it's a choice, but actually, God has made us that we need to be sustained through what we eat. What rules did you obey in driving here this morning? Hopefully, you obeyed them all, because if you decide, nah, I'm not going to stop for this red light, could be a lot of trouble. 
I'm not saying that we don't have a free will. I'm just saying that free will is subject to the fact that we were made for God. Of his own will, he brought us forth. I think that changes our attitude towards him. We are here because of his will, not our own. Who is God? God is the one with total free will. He's also the one that has done this. He's brought us forth by the word of truth. Now, the word of truth here, almost all the commentators I looked at, they think that means the gospel. That's the word of truth. Deception fills God's creation. We're deceived that we can be good enough to save ourselves. Isn't that kind of the standard thing that people talk about? Is that, well, you know, God's got this big scale, and if my good outweighs my bad, then I'll get into heaven. Problem is, that's not what God says in His Word. It's not a matter of me me being good enough. The truth is that when Jesus came, who called Himself the Word, and is described as truth, in fact, John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He himself is the truth. God wants to recreate life through the gospel because we're deceived that life was destroyed at the Garden of Eden. We're deceived into thinking, oh no, that's just a, that's a myth, that's a fairy tale. We're deceived into thinking that I can live my life any way I want. I will try to be good, and therefore God will accept me. We're deceived. The world is deceived. It's God's will to offer truth to us through Jesus and Him alone. God is not destructive. He's constructive. He gave us life. And this possible life by accepting Jesus is through the word of truth. What is his most wonderful and perfect gift? Now, when you're going through terrible times, when you're going through trouble, when you look at the world and and you just say, why doesn't God do something? You know what? He did. He already took care of the biggest problem that exists in this world, and that's sin. He took care of it through Jesus. So the next time you hear somebody say, why doesn't God do something? You get a response. You can say, he did. What do you mean he did? He didn't stop the war in Ukraine. No, because he lets us be sinners. We've rebelled against him and he hasn't just destroyed us. He's given the opportunity by giving us the word through his truth. Who is God? Well, there's just four descriptions right here in these two verses. Our understanding of God and how great He is and all that He's done, how amazing He is, should cause us to come every Sunday that we can to worship Him. It should cause us to live our lives to bring glory to Him in the way we live. Let me conclude by looking at the last half of verse 18 says that we should become a first fruits of His creation. You see, God has a plan. He will help us to not be deceived by what happens in this world. He's given us a book to follow that has His truth in it. Why? So we won't be deceived. And so that when we believe, we can become... Well, let's read it and see. Verse 18. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth that, that word that is so that, we should be a kind of first fruits of His creation. Now, I don't think He's calling us all fruity. First fruits 
If you look in Exodus 34.22, Leviticus 23.10, it's talking about the celebration, the sacrifices, the offering to God of the first fruits. So if you plant something, your harvest, you were supposed to take the first fruits and offer those to God. We're, in a sense, the first fruits. He wants us to live out what it means to be the fruit of the gospel. So each of you this morning can pick out which kind of fruit you want to be. You can be one that's deceived. Or you can be one of the first fruits that God wants us to be. And next week, verses 19 to 27, I believe shows several different ways that we can be the first fruits as the result of accepting his gospel that he offers in truth to us. So this week, try not to be deceived. And if you want to get a head start on next week's message, read James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, and see if you can pick out different ways that sometimes we're deceived, but God doesn't want us to be. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that every person here this morning be, would be one of your children, that every person would be part of the first fruits that you would want. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at this passage in James that talks so much about how we get deceived and we think that you tempt us and we think that this mess is the result of what you've done when it's the result of what we've done. It's our selfishness, it's our pride, it's our lust of eyes, it's the desires that we have physically. Lord, help us to not fall to the temptation and the deceptions and help us to learn and grow and live the truth of what you want us to be and what you made us to be. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus.